Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chief Executive Officer on War and Peace. to TechCon. Um, it's, uh, it's great, as usual, to see uh, a, a bustling environment when one, uh, when one comes into the building. And I came on, on Tuesday, and uh, it, it looked like one of those big conferences that you go to, which is really, uh, really quite great for us. And so, uh, on behalf of everybody at Elm, uh, thank you very much for that, and thank you for your, your support, generally. Um, we've had a good week this week. Uh, it, over the first two days of TechCon, uh, we've had some 12% more people come through the doors than we had in the whole of TechCon uh, last year. I know a number of people are only coming for day three, uh, so we're, we're well ahead of uh, where we were last year. And that's a measure of the increased uh, interest uh, that there is in uh, the armed technology and the ARM ecosystem. We started off the week with uh, great new uh, product announcements, our uh, new uh, Cortex-A50 series, the Cortex-A57, the big one, and uh, the A53, the little one, uh, and uh, you, you heard quite a bit about those on day one. I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the application areas uh, for those uh, later now. I'm going to talk about um, the strength and diversity of the ARM partnership generally, uh, and then pick on a couple of areas. We're going to talk about uh, the server space and how technology from the mobile world is making its way uh, throughout uh, the, the rest of the ICT sector. Uh, and then we hear a lot about the Internet of Things and uh, you know, we have mobile phones connecting lots of people together and we talk about that mobile technology as well as going up into the server space coming into machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication very low power sensors and that sort of thing. Uh, so we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, and I'll have a few assistants uh, coming on at different, uh, different times during this talk. So over the 22 years nearly uh, that ARM has been uh, in existence, the, the, the world of electronics and consumer products has changed significantly. Um, the, the types of products that we had in, in 1990 uh, all very familiar because it was only the other day really, uh, but now completely unrecognisable and in fact uh, changing the way that, that we all live. Um, it is inconceivable for the youth these days uh, to go out from home uh, to meet a load of friends and actually know where they're going and know <laughs> whom they're going to meet when they leave the house because it's kind of, well you pick that stuff up on the way from your phone, don't you? Uh, and that's very much the situation in the developed world. We've become uh, such that these, these things are, are totally indispensable to us. And, you know, I get out of a car or I get off an aeroplane, <laughs> where's the phone? That's the developed world. In the developing world, mobile uh, is also changing uh, the way the world works. Uh, and it's opening up all sorts of economic opportunities. And the world as a whole has really... Uh, in some ways expanded and in some ways shrunk. It's expanded because we can do a whole lot more things. Um, but actually it's shrunk because you know you can have instant communications to anywhere in the world. And, uh, and that's really all happened um, in the last uh, couple of decades. So mobile has been a, a tremendous thing for, I, I'm guessing, most people in this room. And for ARM, it continues to be uh, a sector that we focus on a lot. It's a great place to develop our technology. It's a very harsh environment, really, for developing uh, a, a, a microprocessor um, because you need a tremendous amount of processing power, uh, but you're in a very small form factor with a very limited uh, amount of en total energy available to do the tasks. And so if we can create something really energy efficient for that, uh, then, uh, then we can apply that technology elsewhere. Now, Talking about uh, energy efficiency, uh, the ARM partnership as a whole is, of course, built on uh, a platform of fundamentally energy efficient technology. 
Uh, and um, that's, that's been key to arm from the word go. It's one of the fundamental foundations of our business. And it doesn't just apply to microprocessor designs that we do. It applies to all the different flavors of microprocessor designs we do, graphics processors. Uh, it applies to the software we write and the systems that we design. The other fundamental thing about ARM is uh, our business philosophy, which you know, we talk about a partnership model, and that has been uh, the case from day one, and it remains the case today. The partnership is a lot bigger. On the video, I talked about 300 odd semiconductor companies. Uh, you know, here at TechOn, over the first um, couple of days, we've had well over 3,000 people uh, come through the doors. This is a big community uh, of partners. And our business model works on the basis of sharing. Sharing both the task, we do part of the task of making these fantastic products available, uh, and our partners do the rest. And we bear part of the cost, uh, and they bear another part of the cost, uh, and we all share the rewards. So it's, it's very much a sharing uh, model, and I talk about joint destiny because we are successful only when our partners and their customers uh, and everybody else in the partnership is successful. But what it delivers to the outside world is a tremendous amount of innovation because you have a very broad community with a very diverse range of skills, capabilities, uh, investments and so on. And, uh, and so that, that's really what is driving the innovation. You can have some fantastic technology but it doesn't necessarily uh, lead to fantastic innovation. Uh, but applying this type of business model, this type of philosophy, uh, does. Uh, what it enables is freedom for product designers to, uh, to really innovate as well. And, you know, ARM creates some, some basic architectural technology. We supply microprocessor cores. Our semiconductor partners supply, uh, supply system-on-chip devices. Uh, and then we end up with you know, a huge range of end products. And 2012 has been uh, an excellent year for the ARM partnership. Uh, and included on this slide are actually all products that have been launched during, the, the end products over the right hand side of the slide, have been launched during 2012. And, and these are the sort of classic ARM products, you know, tablets in lots of different form factors. Uh, we've got Google's uh, Chromebook there. Um, but we've also got medical monitoring, recreational products, uh, products to, to, to make life better. Uh, and um, that's the, the, the net result of um, the, the, the ARM partnership enabling that to happen. Um, the ARM partnership, we sometimes uh, describe, um, you'll see it on our website, as the connected community. And this is, this is a community. Is a community of semiconductor companies, uh, software tools companies, design companies, training companies, uh, and over the years we've grown the number of companies within the connected community, uh, and uh, the result is made possible by you know, all the companies represented um, by the people here in this room. Uh, but this year we've we've actually pushed that number over a thousand companies. Uh, for the first time. And what we're ending up with is, is little sort of subsectors of the community with expertise in particular market sectors. And, and as the technology addresses a broader range of market sectors, uh, so, uh, so the community grows. And when the community grows, we can address a broader range of market sectors. And you get a kind of virtuous circle effect. But you know, all of these companies, over a thousand companies now, uh, are working around the ARM partnership to enable the future. So that's enough of an introduction to uh, the ARM partnership. What about that future? You know, what's it going to be like? What is this world that we're bequeathing to the youth that can't go out of the door without a mobile phone? Um, well, it's going to look pretty different. Uh, and um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting that the week started uh, with such a storm uh, hitting New York because it's a very visible um, the, the, the the implications of things like climate change are very visible uh, to us um, with, with that event that happened at the beginning of the week. 
Um, but as we look over the next sort of several decades, we're going to see a growth in the population, huge growth in the population. So the world with its already limited resources has to support you know, an extra 3 billion people. In March this year, the world population just exceeded 7 billion people. Uh, and so 3 billion on top of that is a huge increase over the next 20 years or so. Uh, and already, you know, we're finding people uh, you know, with, you know, never mind, they haven't got mobile phones, they've got water to drink. Uh, and if we look over the next actually relatively short period of time, a lot less time than ARM has been in existence as a company, uh, then we're going to see many more countries with serious water shortages. This is a measure of uh, the way in which our society is using resource. And of course, one of the resources that we care about a lot is energy. And uh, we're looking over the next couple of decades at a tremendous increase in the amount of energy uh, that society consumes. Part of that is driven by population growth, part of it is driven by the population that is there uh, becoming more affluent and, and consuming uh, more things. Well, the good news is that we're not bequeathing a terrible world uh, to the next generation because actually the technology that we're also bequeathing uh, has a part to play in solving the problem. Technology can bring efficiencies and deal with um, better use of uh, natural resources, and in particular energy. Now, you know, in the consumer space, for instance, uh, consumer space is a villain as well. Uh, you know, all these consumer gadgets, they consume lots of power. Um, and, and they don't just consume lots of power directly. All the infrastructure that they're connected to, all the servers that they're connected to, also consume a lot of power. Uh, you know, ICT as a whole consuming about 10% of the world's electricity today. Uh, and as, the, as we, we see a proliferation of, of, of screens over here with ever more resolution, uh, then of course we have a proliferation of data. Uh, and that proliferation of data, whilst it's great because it provides services, uh, that, that also uses huge amounts of energy. So it's a problem, but, uh, but it's also an opportunity because actually we can make these things much more efficient. Uh, if you use a tablet instead of a computer, typically you might only use 16% of the energy to do the same sort of thing. Uh, if you look in the infrastructure space and apply efficient mobile type technology to things like uh, servers and networking equipment, then you save huge amounts of power. If you apply some intelligent technology into uh, the world's electric motors that collectively use almost 50%, almost 50% of the world's uh, electricity, uh, then you can have savings of 25 to 40% in terms of uh, the amount of energy they use. Uh, and the same goes uh, in, in many of our industrial sectors. It isn't just about efficient use of energy, it's also about efficient generation of energy, the ability to generate energy locally so that, uh, so that you don't have to uh, transport it across the country and lose energy that way. Uh, and many of these uh, renewable technologies, whilst um, fine in principle, are hopelessly inefficient, but they can be made a lot more efficient uh, with the inclusion of uh, simple, smart electronic systems. Uh, and so technology uh, certainly has a part to play in, uh, in, in making this world better. Um, we're seeing that happen already. Now I'm going to narrow down a little bit and talk about servers for a while. Remember, ICT using 10% of the world's electricity as a whole, uh, a lot more data. Various people have got all sorts of estimates for how much data is going to be, uh, or what increase in the amount of data that we're going to use over the next couple of decades. Uh, and they're huge numbers, and, and clearly the thing is unsustainable uh, unless we start designing this equipment in a different way. And so we're going to talk about lower power uh, in servers. And it's starting to happen. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the takeaway here is that energy efficiency in servers, A, it's essential because unsustainable data growth otherwise, um, but B, you know, it's, it's real. It's come out of the laboratory and, uh, and it's starting to happen for real. Uh, and you get a reduction both in, um, in, in cost, uh, but a lot of the reduction in cost is 
from a reduction in running cost, uh, which is a reduction in the energy that you have to put in, um, uh, both, to, both to run the computers in the first place and to cool the computers as they get hot. So what we've seen over, over the last um, 12 months is a significant momentum developing. And at ARM, we've been developing this for the last uh, four to five years now, but we're seeing that momentum uh, come into the market. Uh, and we're seeing some results, and you know the good news is that some of the results from some of the first silicon coming out of these silicon companies here, uh, and having people people like these companies here build that silicon into real products, we're seeing results ever so much better than the original experiments that uh, that we did a few years ago. And the experiments that we did a few years ago were great and showed that actually this theory, let's apply some energy efficient mobile technology, put it in the surface space, great idea, save power. Um, we're finding the results are significantly better. So you know, HP's um, Redstone uh, servers are demonstrating things like 90% you know, less energy for a similar task uh, than, uh, than, than, than the normal way in which things are done today and that energy translates into, into cost as well. And throughout the year we've had steady momentum every, every quarter or so with developments um, both in, in the semiconductor end, in the equipment end uh, and in the, in the, in the software that, that enables these things to happen. Uh, and we think that the analogy and the, and the sort of mapping of mobile technology onto servers is um, is really quite strong. It isn't just a nice idea to put energy efficient technology in servers. Um, you know, we have an opportunity here to transform the way in which uh, these things are designed and you know, we believe that the path which we've gone down in computing and in mobile computing from you know, big microprocessor, single microprocessor, microprocessor gets a bit bigger so it does lots of things, then actually is there a more efficient way of doing lots of things where well, we can take a big processor and apply some virtualization software and have, have it sort of do multiple tasks and then we can say well actually those multiple tasks could be done a little bit better on a processor that was a little bit more tailored for that type of task and so, uh, and so then we end up with multiple CPUs uh, and multiple different heterogeneous uh, type systems and because it's based on energy efficient technology we can integrate them on a single chip and save huge amounts of power because we're not driving signals off the chip. And that's pretty much what's happened in uh, mobile computing, mobile phones and so on. So um, that's what's happened in mobile. We think that's also going to happen in servers. And as we look at servers, we find similar to, to what sort of happened in mobile, really. It, it, once you start thinking this way, you say, well, actually, the workloads are kind of different. Some of them need a lot of connectivity, some of them need less connectivity. Some of them need lots of storage, some of them need less storage. And the third dimension on this graph, by the way, comes out of the slide, and we couldn't do that, so we've done it in different colours, uh, and we've, we've colour-coded it. So the green ones come a long way out of the slide because they're um, compute-intensive, uh, and, and the blue ones stay back in the slide because they're sort of compute-moderate. But the point is, in that three-dimensional space, uh, there are different types and one size doesn't fit all and that's exactly what we found in the mobile space and what we found in the mobile space is that the ARM business model is great because it enables different companies to bring different expertise uh, to different solutions to solve different types of problem and so applying the ARM business model with, uh, with multiple semiconductor companies to this problem where we have multiple types of job to do uh, we think is also uh, the right thing. Now we are making um, we are making good progress. Uh, one of the sort of key um, factors which has been holding things back a little is the availability of 64-bit. Uh, but the good news is uh, we announced our 64-bit processors on Monday, uh, on Tuesday, uh, and so that barrier has gone away. We've actually had. Uh, we launched our 64-bit architecture a year ago, and we've had some of our architectural licensees working on this. Uh, and later on this morning, there's an event that Applied Micro are uh, going to be running. Um, and so the hardware is happening. The software also needs to happen, and it is. Uh, uh, and now I'm going to um, 
draw on uh, one of my assistants, because a couple of years ago, you might remember that in the mobile space, uh, we created uh, Lenaro, and that was set up to enable the ARM ecosystem working in mobile, uh, who are working with Linux, to um, reduce the amount of effort that each individual company was spending, because lots of people were doing the same thing uh, in the Linux world, and so what we did with Lenaro was get people together so that they could work together uh, this is an example of that partnership where Arm puts some of the cost in and shares the effort and shares the return with, uh, with other people. Um, uh, and in the, in the mobile world, uh, the Lenara organization has enabled multiple companies to benefit from shared effort. Uh, and so what I'd like to do now is welcome George Gray, who runs Lenaro, onto the stage uh, to have uh, a few words about Lenaro. George. So, uh, over two years ago now, uh, Arm and several of their ecosystem partners joined together to address a common and fundamental challenge uh, for Arm, which was software fragmentation. Um, together they started a new not-for-profit company with a singular focus to drive Linux on Arm enablement and optimization. And that company, as you know, is Lenaro. And the founding members were Arm, Freescale, IBM, Samsung, ST Ericsson, and Texas Instruments. And these members have since been joined by LG Electronics and by High Silicon, the SOC uh, development subsidiary of Huawei. With this new company, we have created a software engineering team to address the challenges of building high quality core open source software for the ARM architecture across multiple different SOC vendors and ARM partners. And I'm very proud to say that Lenaro has achieved great progress in its first two years. In no small way have we helped ARM change to become, as Linus Torvalds recently put it, uh, an outstanding citizen in the Linux community. It wasn't so long ago that he wasn't being so complimentary. <laughs> Today, I am delighted to announce the extension of Lenaro into the enterprise server market with the formation of the Lenaro Enterprise Group, or LEG for short. We've had incredible interest and support for this new group, with over a dozen companies already coming together to collaborate and to accelerate the development of core Linux software ecosystem for ARM servers. <coughs> with the formation of this new group, our existing members are now joined by AMD, Applied Micro, Calceda, <coughs> Canonical, Cavium Networks, Facebook, HP, Marvell, and Red Hat. And through collaboration with these market leaders and more who we expect to join us, LEG will focus on the development, optimization, and delivery of core open source software across the ARM server ecosystem. Lenaro is exclusively a software engineering company and we're dedicated to working with all our members on open source software. Today we have over 120 software engineers working in open source around the world and with this group and further growth we expect to double that number of engineers over the next 12 months. Our unique business model enables participating companies to share the costs of developing common open source software that's then upstreamed and used by the whole community. This approach reduces fragmentation and it reduces costs because each member is not replicating the development of this core software and then trying to all promote their own solutions. It enables each member to spend more of their own software resources 
on their own competitive differentiation, something that's so important around building for ARM. So LEG will help the ARM server ecosystem to leverage the ARM business model to create innovative and differentiated server products built on common, shared, core, open source software that is delivered to all of the server distributions. In conclusion, we are really excited to be working with OEMs, commercial Linux providers, SOC vendors, software companies, and ARM themselves on this initiative. You can see more information on our website. The LEG organization is already underway. The engineering team is formed and plans to initiate delivery uh, of initial software before the end of this year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so um, we haven't quite finished talking about servers because uh, another key element of um, what's going on in servers is a lot of the software being uh, built around Java. And so uh, I think the best people to, to talk about that are Oracle. And with that, um, my other assistant this morning is uh, Judson Altoff from Oracle. So Judson, are you there? <laughs> Thanks. 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 Thanks very much. I'd like to thank Warren and uh, everyone at ARM for uh, inviting Oracle to come talk to all of you this morning. And uh, just to start off by saying it's uh, impressive to see uh, this many people in the audience on day three of a, of a tech conference. So you guys are doing a good job of retaining everybody here. Um, listen, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the strategic partnership between Oracle and ARM and, um, and, and why it's so strategic for us. It may not be inherently obvious uh, to everyone in the room. Um, we're actually working across the board with ARM um, to uh, not only release Java, but, but look at other areas of our portfolio to better support the ARM architecture. Um, in August, we recently announced that uh, we put extensions in place to Java SE 7 so that it would run on 32-bit um, ARM chips. Um, and I'm pleased to announce to you this morning um, that we're also intending to uh, port Java to the 64-bit uh, server platform for ARM. So we want to extend the Java ecosystem um, to all facets of the ARM platforms. Um, and really, I want to kind of give you some insight as to, as to why we're doing that. Um, we're very focused at Oracle on something we call a device to data center strategy. Um, most of you know Oracle um, for our strength in the data center and our core on backend systems um, and what is today become, uh, becoming the big data phenomenon. Today, um, when people talk about big data, big data is, is effectively generated by a universe of devices uh, where humans are interacting with machines. Uh, that market today is in fact gated by the human population. Um, and in turn, we have about 9 million Java developers that uh, support about 3 billion different devices running Java all over the world. We actually think that that um, is about to turn on its head. Uh, we actually think that um, this is just the beginning and uh, you can use whatever cliche you'd like, tip of the iceberg, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, but if the analysts are half right, uh, and the Internet of Things, machine-to-machine -machine communications becomes 50 billion devices, 100 billion devices, um, if they're half right, uh, this market is about to explode. It's about to turn our world um, completely on its ear, uh, solving big data problems when the universe of devices uh, out there is 3 billion. Um, it's a different world when you start talking about 50 billion and 100 billion devices. I want to talk about what, um, what we're doing in that regard uh, to enable an ecosystem. There's no one company that can address this market uh, on their own. Um, we do, however, believe that we're the one company that can provide a platform uh, to enable a partnership ecosystem to take advantage of these opportunities, from Java running on the smallest devices uh, to big, big back-end data systems. Uh, that power the enterprise. We recently announced at Java 1, just about a month ago, uh, that we released a new micro edition of Java uh, that runs on ARM Cortex-M devices in as small as 130K memory spaces. We want to extend Java and the repeatability of Java down to all of these devices. Headless sensors that run in washing machines to fabrics of sensors running inside of automobiles, connected back into systems that provide intelligence and analytics 
to the operators of those systems in the data center. And we're extending a software platform and a pure development platform from the device all the way back into the data center. So why is this important to you? I want to talk a little bit about, um, from an industry perspective, what's happening out there in, in different industries where um, I'm hoping to pique your interest uh, from a development community standpoint. Uh, so if you look at healthcare as a space, uh, where we've traditionally done a lot of work uh, with ISVs that provide systems that run hospitals, healthcare um, is an interesting market because you've got diverging uh, ecosystems, you've got uh, diverging challenges. Most of healthcare is moving out of the hospital and into the field uh, with remote monitoring devices that will measure uh, diabetes patients, dialysis patients, and so on and so forth. At the same time, the complexities around regulatory issues, the sensitivity and the security of data, build, building that intelligence into the device is becoming a bigger and bigger challenge. The chipsets and the silicon rev in these devices faster and faster, an order of magnitude faster than they do in back-end server environments. So the repeatability of the business logic running into the sensor uh, fabric has never been, more, uh, never been more important. Suffice to say that the promise of Java of write once, run anywhere has never been more critical than when you're talking about effectively disposable computing. So we're working with our partners from integrators to ISVs to device manufacturers to build that fabric from device to data center to deliver that promise in healthcare. We're doing the same thing in the mining industry with sensors that run on the end of drill bits providing intelligence back end uh, to, to the folks that need to understand the geological representations of what kind of yields they're getting from environments where humans can't exist. This is the future of computing from device to data center, and we're really excited about partnering with ARM to realize that future, and we're really excited about potentially partnering with all of you. So in just a few moments of time that I have here, I wanted to try to explain to you how we're investing in these markets and just what a critical partner ARM is for us. Um, and a promise to all of you that you'll see us investing more and more. Uh, we want Java running everywhere. We want to enable you to capitalize on those markets to build next generation computing devices in this disposable world of computing that really brings the power of data everywhere back into the folks that can harness it best, the user community. So we're excited about all of this. We invite you to come uh, check out some of this technology, uh, check out some of the sensor technology we have running today in our booth here. Uh, and again, I thank Arm and Warren for inviting Oracle here today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, um, Judson. So I, actually, that, that is a neat bridge, really, uh, because uh, the Java software obviously is an essential building block for what I've been talking about for servers. But as Judson was saying, is an essential building block of what we call connected intelligence. Uh, and uh, I'm going to change tack now and talk about more about what you've just been hearing about. Um, this is connecting machines, this is things, this is the Internet of Things. And, um, you know, the key, uh, it's been talked about for, for several, several years, really, that this is the next wave of computing, computing getting everywhere. But I think it's not just computing, it's the connectedness of that computing, which is vital. Uh, and the good news is that the technology is no longer uh, really the barrier here. You know, we have, um, we have low power efficient technology in all of these stages, the, the sensors, the infrastructure to communicate the servers uh, at the back end. Um, but actually, uh, what's important now is, is getting these things to, uh, to, to talk together uh, and uh, enable the Internet of Things to become uh, an economic reality. Um, if, we, if we think simply about connecting them, then actually we can. Uh, the technology's, technology's in place. Um, but how do we get it really broadly uh, applicable? Um, you know, when we talk about the Internet of Things, we're really talking about all sorts of people who do jobs that have nothing whatsoever to do with technology. How are they uh, going to cope? We're going to have to do lots of training and uh, those sorts of things. Well, actually, are we? Technology should be our slave rather than the other way around. And so, you know, the basic answer is that the things get smarter uh, so that um, uh, there's more intelligence in things so that the people can waste less time 
uh, learning the basics and concentrating on what the people are good at, and everything around uh, becomes uh, some kind of a computer. Now, it's easy for me to stand on a, on a stage and say that at this sort of event. It's, uh, it's very difficult to um, make this sort of thing become a reality because actually it needs multiple people in many industries to come together, work uh, together to align around standards and actually have an aligned uh, vision in the first place. Uh, and when the technology industry embarks on one of these phases with you know, a grand vision, uh, a glorious future, no matter how compelling the result is, there's always lots of vested interests on the way that tend to be commercial uh, and that tends to put a break on things. Uh, so this isn't something which is going to happen overnight, but it's starting now and I'm going to talk about some of the issues uh, involved in, uh, in turning it into reality. Um, the, uh, the intelligence is getting into things. You know, we have examples of cars where you can sort of connect to your home and you can defrost the car in the morning without having to get out. We have an example, this is a little company in the UK that's putting intelligence in, in street lights and those street lights uh, connect together and form some kind of a, a mesh network and so they can be uh, controlled. And in addition, of course, the intelligence in the street light makes the, uh, makes the street light itself be a lot more efficient. Um, you know, perhaps uh, saving up to 40% of the energy. And by the way, talking about ICT consuming 10% of the world's electricity and motors consuming 50%, lighting's second is 20%. So uh, intelligence in these sorts of things, significant impact on saving our natural resources. The thermostat there, smart thermostat, that's great, you know, heating in, uh, and cooling in our houses also uses a lot of energy, but again, tremendous savings from having intelligent programmable thermostats connected to uh, the different pieces of kit around the house. And health, uh, we talk about health, it's a health monitor here, uh, so that um, heart, it, it can be easily worn and um, uh, you don't have to spend days having your heart monitored in hospital, you can carry on with life and uh, the mobile phone transmits the signals back to, uh, back to the, um, the, the doctors who can uh, mo monitor things. So, uh, so technology is starting to actually, rather than just be available, it's actually starting to get used in things. Um, but one of the challenges of realising the, the internet of things as conceived, the big vision, is not just putting the technology in things, but making them communicate. Uh, if we're going to save uh, or make our use of resources much more efficient, then these sensors which are measuring data on a much more granular level than, than ever before, uh, that's the right thing to do. It's of no use if it sits there and just gets measured. And that's what's been happening to date uh, with lots of this technology. So the challenge is how do we connect it? Well, we've got quite a lot of connectivity technology in place. Um, you know, Wi-Fi technology, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is great, Bluetooth, Zigbee, these sorts of things. Um, you know, it's, it's low power, it's quite cheap, uh, uh, it doesn't go very far. Um, we've got cellular network, that's pretty fantastic. Um, but uh, unfortunately, you know, this type of communication uses a lot of energy, uh, it's very costly. And it seems like, well that's life isn't it, you can't get something for nothing. So if we want to go a long distance, it's going to cost us more in, uh, in money and energy. If we want to go a short distance, then great, we can have lower energy and so on. But actually, we want to do both. Uh, the connectivity gap can, however, um, be solved, uh, and there are ways of doing it. Um, what's that? Uh, we believe that by, uh, by using spectrum intelligently, there's a way of getting here. The best type of uh, spectrum uh, for doing this is, uh, is found in, in other communication that's already happened, uh, that is gradually moving from, uh, as technologies like TV broadcast are moving to, uh, to other parts of the spectrum, it's freeing up space below one gigahertz. Uh, and that enables um, radios that can be very cheap, uh, but if you're not transmitting huge quantities of data at vast speeds, you can transmit quite a long way and still consume not very much power. 
Uh, and so that sounds like the sort of thing that we need for the Internet of Things. But the challenge, as I said a minute or two ago, is getting people from all different communities to, to work together. So standardization is necessary. And we're pleased to be supporting the weightless standard. ARM is one of the founders, founder members of uh, the weightless standard. Uh, together with uh, the companies on, um, on, on this slide, uh, and version one of the standard is going to be available early next year, and right now we're looking for people to come and join us. As I said in the video at the start, one of the core competencies that ARM has evolved over the years is partnership and working together, and that's what's absolutely required to make these types of standards a reality. So we think we have a role to play in establishing this type of standard, which in itself has a role to play in turning the Internet of Things uh, in, into something a bit more real. Um, already today, uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the problems, people have solved the communication gap. But they've solved the communication gap uh, within what we call silos. So you have uh, companies, industries, sectors, uh, and, and they can do communication, but the communication is only happening within a, a very narrow range of, uh, of application area and a very narrow range of commercial interest. Things like the weightless standard uh, are going to help break that apart uh, and enable us to uh, connect all of these disparate uh, sensors and measurements uh, through um, up through to, uh, to, to servers, which is great. But now what we need to do is get people to work together to deploy um, to, to standards that enable interworking. And as I say, ARM's already quite good at that. So one of the things that, uh, that we have um, also been working on is uh, the Internet of Things Architecture Forum. Uh, and this, uh, we believe, is a way of avoiding that, um, the Internet of Silos, and making it uh, the Internet of Things. So again, early days. Uh, the goal here is that uh, by the end of 2013, uh, we will have, uh, work working with uh, a handful of companies that have already joined us, uh, we will be uh, establishing recommendations on how data can be exchanged between products in different industries uh, and so on uh, to, to enable the Internet of Things to become reality. So two uh, standards initiatives there uh, that ARM is taking part in uh, to deal with a problem which we believe is not a technology problem at all uh, but a problem of uh, people working together. Uh, if we get all that right then um, you know we really do think there's a massive opportunity here for uh, all the people in this room uh, to, and the company is represented by all the people in this room, to um, to benefit from uh, a society generally benefiting from technology solving some of the real problems uh, in in the world going forward, uh, but also from a commercial point of view, there is an opportunity. There's an opportunity to connect. You know, there's still more people uh, to connect with mobile technology, but what we've just been talking about is connecting tens of billions of uh, devices together intelligently. And this is going to require new ways of working. Uh, the technology is in place. We think we need to embark on it. And if we do that, and we do it with the type of partnership approach uh, that, uh, that, that I started with, then I think as an industry, we're in a better position than we've ever been before um, to change the landscape uh, and, to, uh, and to make the world better. So, I've talked about the partnership as the philosophy. Um, that's enabled a great business in mobile. That's now enabling a, a revolution in infrastructure. Uh, we've talked about a great hope of an Internet of Things uh, as a way of technology uh, solving some of the bigger problems in the world going forward. Uh, and we think all these things are, are related, and in particular, uh, the, uh, the philosophy with which ARM works, the partnership philosophy, uh, I think is the way to achieve that smarter future. So um, with that, that's, that's all I'm going to talk about this morning. Um, we're going to hand over to uh, John Hyman, who's uh, going to introduce a panel uh, to talk about process technology. So thank you very much.
Hello, everyone. My name is uh, John Heinlein. I'm Vice President of Marketing with the Physical IP Division of ARM. I'm very excited today to moderate a panel between some real industry luminaries to speak about the manufacture of ARM-based chips, which ultimately enable the kinds of products that TechCon is all about. Now, before we bring the panelists out, by way of introduction, we'd like to show a short video illustrating some of the scaling challenges the industry faces. It also introduces the new FinFET transistor to show some of the important ways that it differs. The video is narrated by Dr. Rob Aitken, R&D fellow with ARM. Let's show the video. Here is a conventional planar CMOS transistor. On top of a silicon substrate are two electrical terminals, the source and the drain, separated by an electrically controlled gate. When voltage is applied to the gate, a conductive channel is formed and electrons flow from the source to the drain. When voltage is removed, the current should completely cease. However, in modern transistors, substantial leakage flows even when the gate is turned off. Unfortunately, this leakage current increases with every generation of transistor and represents a growing proportion of power consumption. Techniques such as high-K gate dielectrics do reduce the leakage, but are not a complete solution. Materials innovations have increased performance by stretching the silicon crystal structure and increasing current flow. However, they've reached their limit. One solution is to radically rethink the transistor to improve the gate's ability to control current. Let's rotate the conventional transistor and compare with the future FinFET transistor. In a FinFET, the active area or channel of the transistor protrudes from the wafer, allowing the gate to wrap around and control both sides of the FinFET channel. When voltage is applied to turn the transistor on, both sides conduct, delivering more current than a conventional transistor because of a wider active current flow area and increased electron mobility. In the off state, since the gate is on both sides, the transistor can be more completely shut off and a FinFET should reduce leakage lower than a conventional transistor. ARM is taking a leadership position in FinFET IP development to accelerate the availability of FinFET IP for the ARM partnership. We're working closely with Foundry partners to develop prototype FinFET physical IP early in the process lifecycle. Using this prototype physical IP, ARM is currently developing two different FinFET test chips, both taping out in Q3 2012. These efforts continue with ARM's commitment to early development in silicon testing to reduce risk of time to market. Through our early engagement and prototyping work, we actively provide feedback to our foundry partners to assure that FinFET technology is well suited for the requirements of energy efficient SOC design. ARM is further contributing to the technical community by publicly releasing a fully parameterized FinFET transistor model based on the ITRS roadmap and is extending these models to more advanced FinFET designs. Internally, we are modeling proprietary foundry technologies in support of development work on those processes. This is just the beginning of ARM's commitment to FinFET IP leadership. The goal of today's panel is to explore the ability of the ARM partnership, working in close collaboration with foundry manufacturers, to deliver competitive solutions long into the future. ARM is grateful to have three, industry, three senior industry leaders from TSMC, Global Foundries, and Samsung here with us to share their different perspectives on semiconductor manufacturing. Let's bring out the panelists. Uh, beginning at my left is Dr. Shang Yi Chen. He's TSMC's Executive Vice President and Co-Chief Operating Officer. Previously, Dr. Chang was Senior Vice President of R&D and has been with TSMC since 1997. Prior to TSMC, Dr. Chang spent 17 years at Hewlett Packard 
where he held a variety of engineering and management positions in both R&D and manufacturing. During his 30 plus years in the semiconductor industry, he's been engaged in the research and development of a very broad range of semiconductor technologies. Next to him is Dr. Jiangshik Yun, Senior Vice President of Semiconductor R&D at Samsung. He joined Samsung Electronics in 1994 to work on the development of advanced logic processes. Previously, Dr. Yoon was a research scientist at the Korea Institute of Science and Technology, and he worked at Lucent Technologies and Texas Instruments in advanced CMOS logic product process development. He's currently leading the logic technology development team in Samsung's Semiconductor R&D Center and focusing on 14 nanometer and 10 nanometer logic process development. Next to him is Greg Bartlett. Greg is Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at Global Foundries. In this role, he's responsible for the company's technology strategy, research, technology partnerships and alliances, and packaging technology development. He joined Global Foundries in 2009 after a 25-year career in technical and management positions at Freescale Semiconductor and its predecessor, Motorola Semiconductor Product Sector. And last but not least, Simon Seegers from ARM, who is Executive Vice President and General Manager of the Processor and Physical IP Divisions. You've seen quite a lot of Simon this week. <laughs> so, so let's, in fact, let's begin with Simon first. Uh, Simon, uh, in your role spanning the three hardware-oriented divisions of ARM, you're directly involved with the theme of this panel. Can you speak to the importance of man manufacture for ARM-based SOCs? Yeah. Thanks, John. Thanks for that introduction as well. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I uh, look after the, the hardware businesses within ARM, and we've heard a lot uh, this week so far about uh, new architectures, how all of these components come together in the SOC, and a lot this morning about all the software that's got to run on top of it. Uh, but of course, ultimately, that needs turning into silicon. And um, as we all know, there's an insatiable demand for more performance. Uh, we have a very power constrained environment, whether you're running on a mobile phone or even in a data center where energy consumption is a huge deal. So turning that into silicon is a really, really important thing because you can do that well or you can do it badly. Doing it well or badly involves uh, lots, of, uh, lots of different uh, processes and components. Uh, your, your flow for putting the chip together matters. But of course, ultimately, the process that you're going to manufacture on needs to be suited to the task uh, that you ultimately want your SOC to do. And increasingly, as I said, with power consumption being a big issue, no matter what um, end product we're looking at, um, that manufacturing process is a huge ingredient of the performance of the overall system. So it's really vital that uh, we all work together here to make sure that we anticipate the needs of uh, ARM-based SOCs and then work together to tune everything uh, from the processor architecture, the system design, even way down into the transistors to make sure it all comes together. So it's an absolutely vital uh, component for delivering the end system. For the next question, uh, Shang Yi, I'll, I'll take it to you, but it, for the panelists, I'd encourage you, you're welcome to, uh, to contribute to any of the questions. Let's jump right to the heart of the issue. Leading edge manufacturing technology is critical, as Simon mentions, to the advanced devices that TechOn is all about. What do you think are the ingredients for the foundry industry and, by extension, the ARM partnership to remain competitive? Thank you, John. I'd like to share with you the foundry model. Of course, foundry, we Take TSMC as example. What we offer is technology and the capacity. Uh, technology, of course, we try to offer the best leading edge, most advanced leading edge technology. And for the capacity, we like to offer the effective capacity. We can deliver the wafers to our customers with good quality and high yields. In addition, at a very early stage, we developed a leading edge technology. We engaged with our partners. It's all about partnership, like Mr. Warren East spoke earlier, the partnership. We engage with, uh, work with uh, partners who offer the EDA tours to make sure their tour will be compatible to TSMC's technology. So we verify these tours we try to verify at least two tools for each application. So they will be available to our customers when we offer the technology. <coughs> we also engage with standard cell library vendors and also IP vendors. This is very important. 
uh, such as ARM, we engage with ARM usually like about two years or earlier than two years before we release the technology. We work with ARM on the uh, uh, 20 nanometer SOC, 16 nanometer fin fat uh, to make sure when we verify them and we uh, did a hard uh, implementation to so make sure this IP will be available, verified when we release a technology available for our customers to use. And this is very important. We build this uh, uh, ecosystem. We call it Open Innovation Platform, OIP. Is we welcome everyone to be our partner and so the high tech, all that about is innovation. So everybody can put your innovation in this uh, open platform. And we work together so the customer will be able to pick the best of every part. We, we, all, we not try to do everything. We focus on what we do the best. For TSMC, we focus on making the wafers. And uh, we depend on our partners to offer everything else. So the customer will be able to pick the best part for their application from this uh, platform. So this is very similar to ARM's model that I described earlier. ARM has an ecosystem called Connected Community, and TSMC is one of the partners on ARM's ecosystem. And also ARM is one main partner in TSMC's OIP platform. This work out for win-win uh, work out very well. So I think that is uh, in addition to what we <coughs> offer technology and the capacity, this entire ecosystem allow the customer to choose the best part for your application is the most key gradient of what we offer. Thank you. So Greg, uh, for you, the, the industry has been following, as we all know, Moore's Law, which predicts this regular tick of transistor scaling. But recently there's been more skepticism that that scaling can continue into the future. What are your expectations of scaling, and how long will it last, and what will it take to achieve it? It's a very good question, John. Thanks uh, for asking. If there's uh, one prediction that has been uh, consistently made for many decades, and this industry has consistently uh, proven to be wrong, that is that the uh, end of the roadmap is near. Uh, it has required extraordinary innovation. You know, lithography, for example, has uh, enabled and fueled uh, technology scaling for several decades. Uh, about a decade ago, there was a tremendous amount of focus on next generation lithography and immersion lithography emerged from that and we now have uh, extreme ultraviolet lithography in front of us. But uh, lithography has proven not to be enough of an enabler. Uh, as silicon dioxide is the gate dielectric uh, ran out of steam due to uh, leakage curves, some of the things covered in the, uh, in the video you just saw. Uh, the industry uh, transitioned from silicon dioxide to a high-K metal gate dielectric. And that was a key enabler for the next generation of scaling. As we are now at the precipice of uh, running out of gas, so to speak, uh, for 2D planar devices, we are ushering in the uh, advent and the promise that will come from uh, uh, FinFET and uh, three-dimensional uh, enabled devices. But that too will come to the uh, limits of the technology scaling associated with that. There's several more generations of uh, FIN devices that uh, will fuel the roadmap. Uh, but there's work going even on uh, beyond their high mobility devices. Uh, I, I guess I can cite uh, one example that Global Foundries and several other industry leaders uh, in the U.S. participate in. Uh, there's a nanoelectronics research initiative that is focused on what's beyond CMOS, and the uh, focus of that is uh, more than 10 years away uh, with a deliberate intent to solution between now and the 10 that FinFETs run uh, their course that we will, in fact, have another generation of uh, technology available. So, you know, we don't see any end to the near-term roadmap. I think we see the next several generations 
you know, 14 nanometer FinFET that uh, Global Foundries has announced. Uh, 10 nanometer is an active development program in the foundry industry today to enable the kind of uh, performance that uh, ARM wants to deliver in both the server and the mobile space. Uh, the path down to 5 nanometer seems to be pretty clear, and uh, we are very heavily invested in research to perpetuate the roadmap scaling beyond that. Uh, fantastic. This is sort of the opposite of name that tune. It's, it, we'll see how low the number can get before the end of the panel. So we're at 5 nanometer right now. Can I hear, can I hear three? <laughs> but, uh, all, jo all joking aside, uh, you know, to uh, Jung Shik, today the high growth markets uh, that we see and we've heard about today are centered around SOC designs, which as you know have unique requirements such as tighter power requirements, uh, more so than perhaps we see in the PC industry. Do you see this as a strength or a weakness for the foundry uh, industry since performance requirements for mobile devices are increasing? Mm. Yeah. Let me add some more comments to, people, I mean, to the previous like, questions. Sure, please. And the, the, in my point of view, like, for the limitation of scaling, the, in all days, like, our scaling is limited by the pattern that the, I believe in now. It will be like, limited by the like, white cost itself. So unless we have a, like a real good solution for the like the, the cost reduction, web cost reduction, then the people may not see like a net high cost reduction. So to make it happen, so we have to wait like a UV or whatever. Until that time we may have to rely on the double patterning or the uh, triple patterning. And uh, by doing that maybe we may, we may find some way to like a net time reduction. And either, in addition to the like a web cost, the, I'm seeing the another like issue for the scaling down of the technology that is like a performance and uh, and uh, like that's performance. The, especially in the case of, like a 3D dimensional technology, it's very hard to get a good performance with a smaller dimension. So we need to find some innovative way to improve our in power and performance, and especially in the pinpad. Because in the case of PIMPET, it will give a better like a performance and power when we have a last dimension. That's one of the things. And the, another one is like a back end RC. The, in 10 nanometers, back end like a high, the RC will be the real problem. So maybe we may see the, the like a scale limitation from the different point of view. Like, so unless we find a good solution for the, the like a RC reduction, then we may see the another like obstacle to move down to the next level. That's my comment to the scale up. And then we got into questions. Yes. And since we are moving to one single platform technology, different from the previous generation node, and uh, using that one single uh, single platform technology, we are trying to cover the wide application of products. So and then FinFET is gonna be like a, another good way to make it happen. So I, I think the foundry the, uh, industry has prepared like a, the for new process for a long time, so I don't think it's going to like get the, the weakness of the foundry. So we, I think we can handle the problem very well. Thank you. Sure, please. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with uh, what my friend has said. In addition, for TSMC, we worked for so many generations as a foundry technology. I can share with you the, the way we were measured by our customers uh, called PPA, the key index, performance, power, and uh, area. Area is a cost issue. So our customer always evaluate our technology by those three parameters. And like some of the CPU uh, technology, is performance outweigh and, and other things, outweigh powers and the cost. So for when we go into the low power application, I think it's to foundry technology advantage because we are we have been driven by customer for the balance among those three TPA, those three parameters. Also I'd like to share with you the way we judge a technology by three things. One is a transistor performance, second is an interconnect performance, third is a density. Density is a cost issue. And uh, 
like an automobile, the, your engine is like the transistor on the, on the circuit. If you have a very powerful engine, your car can move very fast. And the interconnect is like your transmission and your loading. If your car loads very heavy and your transmission doesn't go smoothly, it will slow your car down. And uh, compare the uh, foundry technology with CPU technology in the past. The foundry technology is usually the CPU technology did have the best transistor, but they, they need that. But the uh, uh, foundry technology usually has a better interconnect performance and a far better density performance, the cost. So those three parameters need to be very well balanced for foundry technology. And that's the way we have been measured for, for many, many years. And then going to the uh, low power application, that become an advantage. Thank you. So there's been a lot of discussion lately about uh, manufacturing capacity. 2011, the uh, total capital expenditures by the major foundries was around 16 billion US dollars. Uh, and the last projections I saw for 2012 were at or exceeding that number. And yet there still seem to be some capacity constraints, particularly at the advanced nodes. So I guess the question for, uh, for anyone, but perhaps Greg, you can start. With the explosion of the volume for mobile products and the importance of those advanced nodes, do you think there's sufficient capacity in the foundry space to satisfy the needs of all the market innovators? Yeah, that is a, uh, a very important topic with uh, many of our uh, uh, customers uh, today. Uh, as the growth driver in the foundry space uh, has uh, shifted heavily away from PC into the mobile space, um, the ability uh, to respond to the chemistry demands has an important trend to it. In addition to just uh, a mobile driver, we have also shifted to these uh, like premier movie launches of mobile products. And as a consequence of that, the necessity of having a fully debugged technology with high yield and high manufacturing capacity early on in the life cycle for mobile products has become a trend that has emerged uh, in, uh, in the industry in the last uh, several years as a trend that, quite frankly, the uh, founders represented on the stage today have all uh, reacted to with the magnitude of the investments that you have seen uh, in the last few years. So, you know, it's a very complex supply chain. I think we have all recognized that mobile is the growth engine in the foundry space going forward. Uh, the growth rate that we see for mobile is going to remain unabated for a significant period of time. And the challenge for us is to work across the ecosystem with our partners, have early tape outs from ARM that come in to fully uh, debug and test out the technology so when a customer does ramp a product that there's uh, sufficient yield uh, and capacity in place. And I, I, I can imagine certainly all three of us are committed to maintaining the capital investment uh, to uh, ensure that there's no reason for customers to not move to the next technology node and bring forth the kind of performance that uh, ARM can enable in the marketplace. Please. The, it's quite challenging issues. So the, as the like, device scales down, like the foundry has been quite like a much more upfront investment and uh, it can be very risky. And uh, one good example is like a shortage of like a 2800 like mobile products in the industry. And uh, there is some chance for us to see the similar situation in the even in the futures. And uh, for like uh, design and product, product point of view, uh, it's very hard for them to overcome the problem of the cost barriers and move to the other address node and it will make uh, invest more risky. So in my opinion, the whole industry has to find uh, some solution for the win-win like, strategy. So to give the better view for the foundry to see the like, future markets, to make uh, upfront investment in less risky, I think that's very important. It's a home to the whole industry, yes. Please, yes. Yeah, I mean, John, to answer your question, uh, the short answer is there's no issue for not enough capacity. The, the real issue, honestly, is the ability to make a good forecast. Uh, 
we, it is a real issue because if we only build the capacity, these days the wafer fair, the capital investment is very, very uh, high. And if you overbuild the penalty, your depletion cost will eat you up. Uh, these days, we only concern about overcapacity. There will be, if we know there is a demand, and we, we clearly know the demand, we will build enough capacity. If we run out of cash, we will borrow money to build it. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is really the good forecast. And this is sometimes a good problem to have, like a 28 nanometer. Uh, some of our new customers, they, their business was more than double what they predict. So the, uh, the forecast they give to us, double and triple within six months. We cannot build the capacity that fast. This is a real issue. Uh, we, on ATSMC, we spend $8.3 billion in CAPEX this year. And next year, we're not sure yet, that will be more than, will be higher than this number. And uh, I'm sure uh, our competitors build a lot of capacity too. So I believe this will, there will be an overcapacity. So the capacity will <laughs> <laughs> But uh, the real issue is a good forecast. That's the real problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. So let's, let's shift gears and let's talk about the new FinFET transistor that we saw in the introduction video. So Shang Yi, perhaps you can start. Some people believe that the rollout of these new FinFET transistors is critical for the competitiveness of the industry. And, and uh, uh, your CTO, uh, Dr. Sun, uh, earlier this week spoke a little bit about that in his keynote. What do you think the foundries and, uh, and also the surrounding ecosystem have to do to assure a smooth transition in the face of this major technology change? Oh yes, again, this is, uh, has a lot to do with uh, partnership and uh, collaboration to make FinFET. Uh, TSMC, we, we happen to be lucky enough, we, uh, we have a CTO in the early 2000, and his name was Dr. Chen Yi Hu. He was a Berkeley, UC Berkeley professor, happened to be the uh, lead led uh, FinFET development from very early stage. So he joined TSMC for five years, took a sabbatical from Berkeley. So we have been working on FinFET for more than 10 years now. So we understood some of the key fundamental issues. And uh, to make it uh, available to the market, we, at the early time, engaged with uh, uh, EDA partners to make sure all the tools will be available because those use very different tools, a very different design and layout. Uh, we engage with our customers at a very early stage, make sure they understood all these issues, and we work with customers to take out uh, their test circuit at the early stage. So when the uh, when this technology is introduced, everything will go very smoothly. Uh, for example, with ARM, um, we engaged with them quite a long time ago. And uh, about early next year, within one quarter, we will tape out the first ARM um, core on um, TSMC 16 FinFET and uh, try to verify the functionality. And, uh, uh, by the end of about a year from now, we will take out the ARM core of FinFET to verify the speed and the performance. So with the early engagement, uh, it is a partnership uh, model. We work very closely with partners, our uh, OIP platform, and allow this thing will go uh, sell very smoothly. That's the way we look at it. Simon, I'd like to get some follow-up from you. You represent uh, so many different parts of ARM. You know, how do you see the ecosystem being involved in this uh, FinFET transition? Well, I think the key, as uh, Shang-Yi mentioned, is, is about early engagement. Um, there's going to be a whole new set of challenges that, that come across with, with any new process uh, technology. But um, as we've gone to more and more advanced nodes, more and more restrictions come in to enable uh, better yield in the manufacturing. 
um, and that's something that you've got to comprehend very early in the design. So it's great that we have such uh, strong partnerships as kind of demonstrated here today, um, that we're able to work with all our partners here on trying to anticipate those uh, challenges in the designs. As the SOCs are a bit more complex, you need some parts of the chip that are going really, really fast, and other parts of the chip are really optimized for density and really low power, and so you need a whole range of technologies. And as the process gets more uh, sophisticated and new physics issues come in, um, it, actually implementing all of that becomes harder and harder. So working early, uh, trans uh, transferring information between each other uh, to really get a, a handle on what's going to happen uh, is vital as an IP vendor to be able to preempt the issues that uh, our customers are going to face ultimately uh, because then they'll be able to get to market much more sooner and uh, with lower risk. So it's a vital component of the, the overall partnership that we have here. John, if I can uh, come in as well. So, um, in addition to having strong partners, they engage early and provide very valuable feedback. Easing the transition from one node to the next is a, a critical attribute. Um, one of the things uh, in our approach is, in fact, to make a thin, friendly set of design rules at 20 nanometer to ease the transition as much as possible. So by working with ARM and the EDA providers to put the ecosystem in place at 20 nanometer uh, and putting in the appropriate hooks to enable the migration of those 20 nanometer IPs and ecosystem uh, to a thin environment, we believe we can lower the barrier for our customers significantly to capitalize on the promise of what a fin will offer uh, while minimizing the overall risk and, uh, and difficulty associated with migrating those designs into uh, a fin fit. Please. So, frankly speaking, the, we are not supposed to underestimate like, the difficulties and challenges in the fin fit. Yeah, even though like, Samsung started development for the fin fit in the very early stage, the same time frame as like, like, TSMC. And I, I will be sometimes one of the like a company who published <coughs> the many papers in terms of the number of papers and patent, but still the, we had to overcome several barriers such as like variabilities and the regularities. And at this point, the my compass level to deliver the 14 of the technology in time is pretty high, but still like that is something we need to overcome. And the. The, even though it's like a very new technology to the foundry industry, the, the, we need to find some good way to handle the variation and the realities and the, some out of unknown hidden factors. Uh, I think that's very important things that we need to uh, visualize in the future. So from the perspective of what the FinFets will bring, I think we talked about the challenges and I think that's understood. But from a perspective of what the FinFets will bring to the, uh, to the market, uh, do you think FinFets are a game changer? Is it a fundamental shift? Or just another innovation sort of like HiK was in the 28 nanometer generation? Perhaps, uh, yeah, Greg, you'd like to speak to that or Dr. Dr. Yoon? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, five or six years ago when people were struggling with, uh, with uh, static gate leakage from the silicon dioxide dielectric, the promise of moving to HiK metal gate was con considered to be a, a game changer. Today, the lower static leakage and the uh, improvement in, uh, in gate performance is in fact uh, considered to have uh, been a, an entitlement to, associated with the transition to high volume, high gate middle gate uh, technology. So as we look forward to FIN, for sure the low operating voltage and the voltage range upon which you can uh, uh, run a, uh, a double-sided uh, uh, device offers a significant promise. Uh, as jean chic said, there's a, a number of manufacturing-related control uh, challenges that uh, threaten the promise, but uh, you know the ability to offer the kind of voltage range and the low operating voltage that a uh, fin device offers into the hands, especially in the mobile space, uh, is, a, uh, is a significant promise. Uh, it's going to come down to the ability to work across the ecosystem, work with power partners such as ARM to debug uh, IP ahead of time, and realize the technical solution in the end product manufacturer. It's one thing to show cross sections of devices, it's another very complex thing to realize it in the product performance. That only comes as a consequence of very tight collaboration from uh, uh, A to Z across the uh, supply chain. Okay, uh, Jack, you, you've Samsung is, uh, is 
talked about uh, FinFETs as well. I mean, what's your expectation of the benefits that FinFET will bring? And is it a big step function, do you think? Yes, yes. It feels like, it, as you may know well, like a 20 nanometer does not delete like a 20 nanometer does not delete like a expected performance compared to 28. And the 28 is, since the foundry started to use a high camera gate, I think the foundry delivered like a, the performance requirement to the industry. But in the 20, it's kind of like the last node of the plant across, so it's very hard for us to improve the like our performance and the power reduction. But the film fed is definitely game changes. In addition to the like power and performance, and the, we are seeing the very good VT uh, mismatch and the uh, lower like booming characteristic of the passion cell. The the based on our current like the, the our silicon, we have come from the very low operation of SM boom. It's much better than like our the, like, expectation. The with some some like a reasonable like a, the SM cell size, I think we, it's going to be possible to operate the SM cell even close like a, between the 0.5 and 0.6 volt. Okay. So Simon, uh, shifting gears, let's let's talk about uh, new technologies and new technology drivers. Uh, this week we saw Arm's announcement of the Cortex A50 series cores and Warren just wrote, of course, about enterprise applications looking into the future. You know, at different times in the industry, key markets that have driven the technology curve have varied, and as we see mobile, is clearly driving today. Do you see that trend continuing, or do you see a more evolving influence from markets like enterprise? Well, I think really that those two things are actually the same. Um, you know, what we're seeing across a wide range of markets, including you know, data centers today, <coughs> is that all the things that uh, uh, make mobile good are highly applicable in lots of other markets. Everything is power constrained. And uh, you know, once upon a time, you just worried about how much electricity could you get from a wall socket. Well, it turns out that's not enough due to the uh, just explosion in the amount of data processing that we want to do. So everything is power constrained. And all the learning, uh, all the experience that we have of building mobile devices which run off you know, small batteries um, is now being applied to all other markets. So I think as we go forwards, all problems will look like mobile problems. And the, the uh, uh, solutions to that that we create for mobile will then be applied into these other markets. <coughs> and obviously the, the optimization points might be slightly different, but fundamentally I think, I think all problems are going to look quite similar in that regard. And you know, the low voltage operation that, uh, that FinFET's promise is going to be great across all of those end applications. Being able to scale up performance, scale down the uh, uh, voltage, lower power when you don't need it, everything we're delivering through Big Little, all of these technologies I think will become applicable in just a very wide range of markets. So the, the mobile drive, you know, I think will we'll set the tone for other technologies behind it. So Shengi, as we mentioned uh, earlier, with the, the shift to having one major process technology per node now, uh, as we've seen in the last uh, and in the future, uh, you, is there a big difference between the optimizations you put in the process for mobile versus the optimization you put from a server application, sort of building on Simon's point? Uh, the, for the CPU application, like I, I said earlier, you really care a lot more about performance and power cost can be compromised. So in that particular case, you, when you design your technology platform, you, you look at, uh, you try to optimize in a different way. The transistor, uh, for example, you, you can afford a little bit higher leakage current if, you, if it gives you enough driving power. For the interconnect, the CPU, the metal skin tend to blow up from every layer, go up and up, the metal pitch become wider and wider. Because uh, in that case, your resistance uh, drop will be less. But for the uh, foundry technology or for the low power application, when you care about power uh, performance in a dense state, you the metal skin go all the way up with the same pitch, so you get a better dense state, and of course you compromise a little bit in performance to get a good balance. 
So the focus are quite different when you try to design the technology for different applications. And if you are good in one and you try to go to the other, it takes some time to learn the trick for the other side. The, the I would like a Chinese comment. The, uh, for the thinker, I think we have some chance to use a single platform technology for the low power CPU and the mobile applications. And uh, since we're gonna like uh, the offer the, the several flavors of ETH options to realize like a uh, higher performance and the lower latency. So if 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 designer choose a light resume of the ETH, then there's some chance for the like a designer can make uh, the low power CPU and the uh, mobile application using the same single platform technology, that, that, that's my thought. Okay, so we're almost out of time. And our, for our final question, you know, coming back to the really theme of the panel, is can we deliver sustainable manufacturing leadership? Uh, do you think that the ARM partnership will be able to have the manufacturing it needs to maintain its lead in mobile and energy efficient devices in the future? Maybe we'll start with that, Greg. Yeah, it's why we're here today. Uh, ARM is a strategic partner for us. Uh, they sit at the uh, uh, center point of uh, the vast majority of our, uh, our customer base and by working directly with them, uh, looking at their future architectures, working with their physical IP division uh, to solicit feedback as, quite frankly, the earliest engaging customer uh, in defining a next generation uh, technology you know, we are absolutely committed to ensure the technology and manufacturing capacity are there uh, to enable the, uh, the ARM ecosystem. I believe there's no question uh, ARM has the best uh, architecture for, for this uh, low power application and uh, they will continue to be successful. I think one, one parameter probably has been underappreciated is, is a partnership model. This partnership really is a good model. So we, everybody in this ecosystem do what they do the best. And this, uh, everybody work to collaborate and to compete. The, so the user will be able to choose the best part from every function. And this, this model will be we believe will be successful. And TSMC will support this model from uh, technology and capacity point of view and to make this model it's a win-win situation. Thank you. And John Shik? Yes, uh, I will say, I will use this term as like a one big virtual idea model. So if you collaborate with the arm and the with our eBay vendors, and we can deliver very competitive technologies, same as like IDM, so we can work as a one IDM company using the cloud model. And, and Simon, you get the last word. Yeah, so I, I have the benefit of working very closely with these guys. So, um, uh, you know, as I look at the, the uh, manufacturing challenges that we, that we have to address, uh, when I look at the opportunities ahead of us, you know, they say two brains are better than one. You know, there's four of us here and there's hundreds uh, of companies in the ARM partnership who are all innovating in different ways and, and working together um, and sharing best practice to, to push technology as a whole forwards. And I think it is that collaborative uh, model, not just between us, but with all our foundry partners, customers, who are innovating in different ways uh, that are bringing just a lot of creativity and inventiveness to, to the challenges that we face. And, and I'm certainly very confident that uh, all of that effort in many companies across the planet is going to lead to the best solution and ultimately a lot of choice in that in what that best solution looks like so i think this partnership is very strong is going to be able to deliver continued leadership in all the markets that we serve okay, well, please join me in thanking the panel all right now before you leave there's there's still uh, one more one more item of business um, uh, I'd like to first by summarize by saying, even though this is day three, there's lots more to do here at TechCon. We have over 90 exhibitors, a full day of classroom sessions, including sponsored sessions, as was mentioned earlier, on servers, and one from Microsoft with the deep dive on Windows RT, which I'm sure is very exciting. 
The event today closes at 4 p.m. And we hope uh, you've enjoyed these three days, and we, we want to thank you for your support of the ARM partnership. And now I'd like to finish by introducing Brian Fuller, who's Silicon Valley Bureau Chief of EE Times, who's going to present some Best in Show awards. Thanks, John. What a great panel. We won't uh, keep you too long. Um, we were tasked with uh, spending some time on the floor, uh, especially yesterday in the whole spooky Halloween smoke-filled room thing, and looking for uh, interesting software and interesting hardware. And uh, so we came across uh, a couple, and we want to give out uh, Best of Show awards for those. Uh, the first is on the hardware side, uh, a company uh, long known in the communication space is now driving rather aggressively into uh, embedded uh, with its Snapdragon S4 processor, and that would be Qualcomm. Is there anybody from Qualcomm in the audience? <laughs> we'll catch up with you later. And on the software side, these guys came out of the closet uh, at Design Automation Conference, and they too are making a big push in the embedded space with a flow that takes C and C++ and uh, spits out uh, programmable VLI W processors. Very cool. Uh, let's have a round of applause for Best in Show Software, Essencia, in the EDA space. Essencia. Hopefully, Robbie is here. If I can open this without dropping it on my foot, we will give you your award. <laughs> 